Now let's take a look at uh, two more colligative properties. I'm going to start with boiling point elevation. And so that uh, sounds a little bit similar to what we looked at last time, freezing point depression, but it's for a different phase change. Now it's for a liquid becoming a vapor. And so all the arguments are going to be essentially the same. We're changing the name of the phase to some extent. So let's consider a gas in equilibrium with a solution again. So that's the liquid that has something dissolved in it where the liquid form of the gas is the solvent. And so, again, picking our favorite solvent, let's make it water. So that would be steam in contact with aqueous solution. So in that case, the, the chemical potential of the gas, the steam, which is pure, is equal to the chemical potential in the liquid at that temperature where both are present in equilibrium, the vaporization temperature. And we know the liquid, which is a solution, will be equal then to the chemical potential of the pure liquid plus RT log the activity. And uh, we will now follow exactly the same steps as in the last video. So I'll go through them a little bit more quickly because we've already done them in great detail once. So I rearrange to solve for log A as something that involves the chemical potentials of the pure phases, but now it's a gas and a liquid instead of a liquid and a solid. I differentiate with respect to T again. I take advantage of the Gibbs-Helmholtz relationship again, which means that those things on the right-hand side will differentiate to enthalpies. So now I have the enthalpy of the liquid, the enthalpy of the gas. We call that the enthalpy of vaporization, where last time we worked with the enthalpy of fusion. And uh, one thing to note, by comparison to freezing point depression, the last time the order of the phases was such that we got directly out the enthalpy of fusion. In this case, the ordering of the phases is such that we get out negative the enthalpy of vaporization, right? This is the enthalpy of the liquid minus that of the gas. But enthalpy of vaporization is defined the opposite way. It's the enthalpy of the gas minus the enthalpy of the liquid. So I'll rearrange one more time and I get this uh, derivative expression. And once more, I can integrate it <clears throat> I'll do the same integration from a pure liquid to some solution that has something dissolved in it. And that will have corresponding pure liquid temperatures as well as the temperature at which the solution that includes a solute is boiling. And when I do the integration over those limits, again on the left hand side I just get log of the activity. I continue to do an integral of 1 over t squared and make an approximation that the boiling point won't be too different from the pure substance boiling point. If I really cared, of course, I could plug in actual values, but this is to see qualitatively what's going on. So we'll accept this approximation. Again, the log of the activity coefficient is necessarily negative because activity is always less than one in the mole fraction standard state, which we always use for the solvent. Vaporization is necessarily positive, the enthalpy of vaporization, because you've got to break apart the liquid-liquid interactions in order to become a gas. And since the constants are all positive and the temperature is a positive number, that means that since there's a minus sign here, and this is negative, and these are positive, this must be positive. That is, the temperature at which the liquid solution is boiling must be higher than the temperature at which the pure substance boils. That is, the boiling point is elevated by adding a solute to the liquid. So I'll continue to define the change in temperature as the temperature of the solution minus the temperature of the pure substance. Again, that'll be a positive quantity because the boiling point is going up. And so I'll, I'll just rewrite the equation having plugged that in. And again, just because water is kind of a convenient one to look at, taking advantage of this relationship between log of the activity coefficient of the solvent in mole fraction related to the molality of the solute. I can rearrange this expression having made this substitution and I get that the change in, you see an interesting typo there, no doubt from a copy paste at some point, so clearly this should say delta T vape, not delta T fuse. So a little bit of, uh, it's like an outtake that we won't actually take out. Homegrown videos. Um, 
is equal to R times the vaporization temperatures divided by the vaporization enthalpy times 55.51 moles per kilogram. Just collapse all those constants into Kb, and again, molality sticks around. And now for water, that value is 0.51 Kelvin kilograms per mole. Right? So molality continues to be independent of solute, and so we have a way to determine, given an addition of something to the solution, and given this constant, how much will the boiling point go up as a result of that addition? It's always fun to you know, play with one of these. Great opportunity for a self-assessment. Um, this one is a, a kitchen chemistry question. So you will find in certain places on the uh, interwebs the contention that the reason one adds salt to water prior to making pasta, boiling that uh, salty water, is that you know these people know a little science and they know that you raise the boiling point when you add something to water. So salt turns out to be something called an electrolyte. That is, it, it is a, it's something made of ions that separates into its ions. The wording in the question here tells you what you should do with that. You basically get double the amount of things. Remember, a colligative property only depends on how many things you put in. When you put in one sodium chloride, it separates into a sodium and a chloride, so that's like two things, so you get a factor of two. And so the question is, if you wanted to raise the boiling point of a gallon of pasta water, let's just use the strange units we use on this side of the Atlantic, by a lousy one degree Celsius, now we're mixing units, we'll, we'll use a Celsius unit too, how much salt would you actually have to add to that water, then boil it, and then toss in the pasta? Okay, I'll let you work on that. So here's the answer to that question. Um, it debunks uh, an urban legend to some extent. Uh, you will discover that the amount of salt you need to add to have any significant effect on the boiling point, or, or even a, an insignificant effect, is far more than uh, you would ever want to eat any pasta coming out of that water. So I don't recommend trying that experiment and then having dinner thereafter, um, but it, it's always good to uh, do some myth busting. Let's move on to a different colligative property, and not one similar to the other two we've seen. And that is the phenomenon of osmotic pressure. And so here is a, an apparatus, again, I suppose we might say, that one could set up this is a tube, it's open on both ends, and in the tube is a little membrane down at the bottom here. It's called a semi-permeable membrane. So what the membrane does is it lets the solvent flow through to either side. But dissolved into the solvent on one side is a solute. On this side, it's pure, so pure solvent. On this side, I've dissolved something in. Could be anything, as we'll see in a moment. What you discover if you do this experiment is, as you, you know, dribble in a little bit of solid or liquid or whatever it is you're putting in on this left-hand side, the pure liquid will flow from the right-hand side into the left-hand side so that the level of the left-hand side rises compared to the right-hand side. All right? And we actually can define how much more pressure is being applied to the system on the left than the system on the right simply by knowing what's the density of the liquid, so there's this extra liquid, that is distributed over a height times the gravitational constant. So if you like, density is in mass per volume. We're multiplying times a length unit, so you get mass per area. And pressure is mass per area times the gravitational constant, which gives you a, a way to express force. Right, and so let's define that pressure then as capital Pi. So what must be the case is that at equilibrium, the chemical potential on the left of the solvent, left side, must also be equal to the chemical potential on the right side, which is the pure liquid. So that's an easy one. The chemical potential on the right side is the chemical potential of the pure liquid at whatever temperature you're working and atmospheric pressure because this is an open tube. On the left-hand side, on the other hand, the total pressure is the atmospheric pressure plus pi, this extra amount of stuff that's pushing down, plus RT log activity, right? Because this is no longer pure. <clears throat> so if you remember, 
the partial derivative of a free energy with respect to pressure is the volume. So the partial derivative of a pure substance is the molar volume of the pure substance. So in essence, I can think, I can now rearrange this equation a bit. So let me pull this over to the left-hand side. So I've got chemical potential at the higher pressure minus chemical potential at the lower pressure of the pure substance. I mean, these are terms in my equation. So what is that? Well, that's actually the integral from P to P plus capital Pi of the derivative of the chemical potential with respect to pressure, depressure, right? So I'm, that's, I'm getting mu star minus mu star at one state point minus mu star at a different state point by integrating the differential over the range of those two state points, which vary by pressure. And this term is still you know, being maintained. Okay, but the good news is that I actually, uh, I, I know what this term on the inside is. What is the partial derivative of the chemical potential of the pure substance with respect to pressure? It's just the molar volume of the pure substance. That's something I can look up in a, a tabulation somewhere. And the integral of dp, so that's a constant, right? I can actually pull it completely outside. So I end up with just the integral of dp from p to p plus pi. Well, that's easy, it's, it's pi. So this, is, this, this, this entire integral is equal to pi times the molar volume of the pure liquid. And now I'll move this over to the other side. It's minus RT log the activity for an activity very close to one. That's minus RT log of the mole fraction. That's Raoul's law. For a dilute solute, actually we don't need to invoke dilution yet, for uh, the relationship between mole fractions, x1 is equal to 1 minus x2. When it's dilute, the log of 1 minus x2 is about equal to x2. And finally, what is x2? Well, it's n2 over n1. Technically, it's n2 over n1 plus n2, right? But if there's so little n2, the denominator is, that's why there's an approximation here. So the denominator is mostly n1. So the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this molar volume and I'm going to put it over here, I'm going to divide this term over here by the molar volume. So I get the number of moles of the solvent times the molar volume of the solvent. Well, that'll give me the total volume. So I've got number of moles of solute per total volume. Oh, that's concentration. That's concentration in units of molarity in this case. So my final answer, which simplified in a beautiful way, is that the osmotic pressure is equal to the concentration of the solution times R times T. And so this is, this is used for a, a lot of different purposes. This is trivial to measure, obviously. We can measure this height. We know the density. We know the gravitational constant. So we can measure the pressure very, very easily. We know what temperature we're working at, and we know the universal gas constant. So by measuring the pressure, we know the concentration. So sometimes this is used for unknowns. You've got an unknown, and you don't know its molecular weight. You can add it to one of these osmotic pressure tubes, look at how much the, uh, the left side goes up compared to the right, and now you know the concentration of the solution, so you know what the molecular weight must be in order to reach that concentration in moles per liter. And so here's a particular example, actually, that is uh, worthwhile and interesting. Now let's say that I apply additional external pressure. So I, I push harder on this than just the osmotic pressure. So as I push harder and harder, the chemical potential is such that I will flow pure liquid from the left side to the right side. That is, it'll come through this membrane and fill up the right side. And so you can ask yourself, would this be useful for purifying seawater, for example? Seawater has lots of sodium chloride dissolved in it, other things dissolved in it as well. So it turns out that the pressure that's necessary to do that, it certainly does work. You can purify water by applying strong pressure and sending it through one of these membranes. The problem is that to desalinate seawater, you need 26 atmospheres of pressure at 15 degrees Celsius, which is kind of a comfortable temperature. 
And if you uh, ask what 26 atmospheres of pressure is, given the density of the water, that is how high a column of water do you need in order to push down with 26 atmospheres of pressure? Sadly, it's uh, 269 meters. That's about 87 stories. So it might seem like, wow, this is a way to solve all the fresh water problems on Earth. All you do is you grab some seawater and you press hard on it. The trouble is you need to pump it up 87 stories and then pour it into a tube so that it flows 87 stories down out through your semi-permeable membrane. And it takes a lot of energy to pump all that water up 87 stories. So it is not yet a viable uh, way to purify large quantities of water on Earth. But uh, you know, if you're lucky and there's a deep hole in the ground and you want to live at the bottom of that hole, then you can pump some seawater in and get some fresh water uh, just for yourself. All right, well, uh, that is the end of these other colligative properties. Next, we are going to move on to look more carefully at electrolyte solutes, which we've toyed with a little bit in uh, the last video, but now we'll pay close attention to them.